So I thank Mike every week because it's his fault that you have to hear about the Holy Spirit every week. Um, thank you. I, I appreciate that. See, I'm bolstered for another week. Um, the song uh, or the hymn that we just sang, As the Deer, right? Psalm 119. The plan was at the end of uh, Thessalonians, at the end of 2 Thessalonians, my plan was that we were going to go into the summer of Psalms and, and pretty much Psalm 119 was going to take the entire summer and then some. And then I think it was uh, six, seven weeks ago in Mike's, Mike's class in Sunday school, um, the question was raised, why doesn't the Holy Spirit work today the same as he does in Acts? Why, why is he not um, on the move in the way that he shows himself in Acts? You, you open it up to chapter 1, and the Holy Spirit is resting on the apostles like tongues of fire, right? And they are filled with the Holy Spirit at that moment. And the Holy Spirit takes over. And we see these guys who are a bunch of scaredy cats. Remember, they're huddled in this room with the doors locked and the, and the windows uh, uh, drawn and everything. And they're doing this so that nobody can get to them. Their rabbi has given them this mission, but they are too scared to act upon it, right? Jesus has said, you're my guys. Go and make disciples. Now, they're too scared to do it. They're too scared because they've seen what happened to Jesus, bless you. They're too scared because they are not sure of themselves. They're still thinking that they have to go out in their own power, in their own knowledge, that they have to have all the answers to all the questions. And they have totally missed everything Jesus told them. Remember what Jesus promises them in John, right? When he's praying for him, he says, I'm going to send you one better than me. I'm going to send you one who's going to dwell in you. I'm going to send you one who's going to fulfill that new covenant. And they still don't get any of this. So the Holy Spirit becomes much more dramatic. And as the Holy Spirit rests on them and Jesus leaves... And they're sitting there and say, okay, we, we have to move. We have to get out of this room. They're now empowered. They suddenly believe that they have enough answers. Their feet are actually moving out into the world. And of course, we see it's all the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is empowering them. The Holy Spirit is giving them the courage. The Holy Spirit is giving them whatever knowledge they need. And they go out and out and out. And we see, of course, the church being founded in the first century. We see them going from place to place. They get arrested and thrown in prison. And, and uh, uh, they sing hymns, right? They're, they're uh, caring for each other. And the, the Spirit is getting them out of prison. And, and what is, they skip, right? They skip away from prison every time. And so it is this Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. And so the question I asked, or the question that was raised in class was, why doesn't the Holy Spirit work like that anymore? I know it's 20 centuries away, but why don't you and I see the same thing? So we search through the Bible. We have searched a, a, a number of different places to see what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit and whether or not he's changed. And I have yet to find that passage that says that the Holy Spirit stopped working in the first century or the Holy Spirit has, has stopped doing spectacular things or the Holy Spirit has done anything like this. So as we've looked at this over and over and over, we've had to come to the conclusion that the Holy Spirit hasn't changed. We have. Christ's church through the centuries has changed.
Christ Church changed the most during the Age of Enlightenment or the Age of Reason, whichever name you want to put on that historical uh, period. And in the Age of Reason, science and fact came to rule over things, pushing the supernatural to the side. We believe in science. We believe in whatever we can put our eyes on. And if we can't put our eyes on it, it doesn't exist. So that became the, that became the cultural belief. That, that became the belief of most people. And what happened was the church, instead of fighting through, instead of trusting this Holy Spirit of the first century, instead of trusting the fact that God himself dwelt in us, not us, but in, in us as the church, the church says we're going to accommodate the world. And what happened to the faith is we became much more oriented around theology and doctrine and facts and having the answers and then we allowed that to guide our footsteps. That became our marching orders to the exclusion, almost, of the Holy Spirit. So that's what's changed over the years. But here's something that is true. Paul writes a lot of things that are true. And he gives us the most quotable passages and verses to memorize and apply. Here is something that is true about God's people then, now, and will be true about God's people into the future until Jesus returns to get us. In 1 Corinthians 6, he says this, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You and I and every Christian who has ever lived, whoever will lived, that's a true statement about us. We have been washed clean by the Holy Spirit. We are being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. We are being guided and taught and enlightened by the Holy Spirit. Same Holy Spirit that was at Pentecost. The same Holy Spirit that will, that will come and dwell in our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren and their children, however long history goes, that same Holy Spirit is the one that is working here in 1 Corinthians in the first century when Paul writes this letter. It is the same Holy Spirit that is working now in the 21st century. It's the same Holy Spirit that will be working in the future. And so if this is true of us, and it is, Bible says it, it's true. If this is true of us, that we have been washed and sanctified and changed and charged with the calling, then if the Holy Spirit is not working the way that he has, it's because of us. It's because of the church, of us becoming uh, too doctrine-oriented, too theology-oriented, and less pneumatological. I had to use that word today, pneumatological. How about that, okay? Less spirit-filled, right? But that's not fatal. The Holy Spirit is ready to be the Holy Spirit's ready to go to work. The Holy Spirit is ready to work in us as Christ's people because this is true. He's already washed us. He's already sanctified us. He's already raised us up. He's already changed us. Or he's in the process of doing those things. He's just waiting for us to move. Somebody, I didn't see who it was, stood up and confessed this morning that he failed to move his feet when the Spirit put an opportunity in front of him. Right? Right? All right, well, I loved what you said. I wasn't going to use your name. I'm sorry, I'm pointing right in. Okay. Not like it's a mystery who said it. All right. But the Holy Spirit will move on to the next person. If the Holy Spirit wants to reach Rick, Rick right, and I fail to do it, he'll use Kayla to do it. The Holy Spirit will work and accomplish Christ's task. And if we won't do it, or we 
feel like we're not ready to do it or, or whatever. The Holy Spirit will continue to work. So wouldn't it be better if we let the Holy Spirit work through us? Wouldn't it be better if we recognize the power of the Holy Spirit? Something that's come up as we've explored these, these different topics is it's one of the Age of Enlightenment artifacts that we see the Holy Spirit in a different way other than as a person. We see the Holy Spirit as this power. We see the Holy Spirit as the one who, who uh, uh, does parlor tricks. We see the Holy Spirit as this nameless, shapeless void. But the Bible describes the Holy Spirit as a person. He is the third person of the Trinity, the third member of the Godhead. And as a person, he is deserving and desiring and wanting of relationship with you and I the same way that we envision Jesus wanting to have relationship with us. The same way that we call God the Creator, God the Father. We recognize relationship there. We've seen Jesus or pictures of Jesus, and so we, we can envision having personal relationship with Him. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, because we're people of reason, we're people of science, we don't see ourselves as having relationship with him. And that's what I want to talk about today. We want to talk about having relationship with the Holy Spirit as this step necessary for us to once again experience that power, experience what he did at Pentecost, experience people being saved by hearing the gospel through us or seeing your lives of the gospel, people coming to want to know about the Jesus that you worship, the Jesus that you follow. That's what we want to find out about. I gave you a question last week. What have you changed in your life since we've been exploring the Holy Spirit? What have you changed, right? Not what the Spirit has changed in you, but what have you changed in relation to the Holy Spirit? And I'm going to give you a, a second question to ponder today. Why, in the Bible, does the Holy Spirit, why does God want to be with you? Why does God want to be with you? I'll give you the answer up front. So God wants to be with you because he loves you. The Bible is pretty clear about that. God loves you. He wants to be with you. He desires to be with humankind. He desires to be with what he created. We recognize this in his plan of redemption. Right? God is not in the business of destroying everything a second time, wiping everything out, and starting over again. You've, you guys have all read Revelation, right? You get to that part just before maps, and what does it say? At the end of history, God is going to restore. He's going to bring the new heavens and new earth here into this world, someplace you and I are familiar with, He's going to bring those into the world and we will all go and dwell with him forever. So God wants to be with us. Why? Because he loves us. Why does he love us? Because he created us. Because it is his desire. It is his aim to be in relationship with us. And so when he sent Jesus, it is so people could relate with Jesus. They could see Jesus in human form. And then that perfect human, that never having sinned human, goes and becomes the perfect sacrifice. Behold the Lamb of God. Thank you. Good timing, Ms. Mark. Hey, so behold the Lamb of God. There's the one who atones for the sins of all time. And then the Holy Spirit comes and we're lost. The Holy Spirit becomes this power. But everything that is true about God, everything that is true about Jesus the Christ, 
is also true about the Holy Spirit. Why does God want to dwell in us? Because he loves us and because he wants to be with us. Let's go to 1 Corinthians this week. We're going to start in chapter 6. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19. When Paul writes the letter, or the two letters, to the church at Corinth, um, it's because they're not being very good people. Right? They have a lot of problems in Corinth. And Corinth, uh, the city itself, has a lot of problems. They have infected the church. They have, uh, uh, the, the church has become soft to the morality of the culture. And so on and on and on. So there's a lot of problems going on in their sexual immorality being one of the major problems that are being experienced in the church. The leaders of the church allowed this to come in. They tolerated it. They put up with it. And so Paul is writing to address that issue. So if you run your finger down to verse 19, this is what he says in contrast to this. He says, you guys are allowing your bodies to be used for an ignoble purpose. You guys are allowing yourselves to be pulled into the culture rather than standing apart from the culture. And he says this, really a question. Verse 19, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. This is a new statement. He said, look at the way you're living. Look at what you've allowed into the church. Look at what is guiding your decision making. Have you stopped for one second and realized not just that God dwells in you, but you are the temple of God. Now to say that is the same thing. To say that God dwells in you and you are the temple, two ways to say exactly the same thing. But do you stop and think that you are the temple of God? Do we collectively, as Christ Church, stop and consider the fact that at every moment of every day, no matter what you're doing, you are the temple of God? It doesn't have the same impact for us as it would in the first century. In the first century, the temple is still standing. In fact, the temple makes its appearance all the way back at chapter 1 of Genesis, when God creates the garden. That is the first temple. Because the temple is the place where God is. The temple is the place where God lives. And he lives in this intimate relationship with Adam. And they get along wonderfully. They're talking to each other. They're experiencing one another's presence. God loves Adam. Adam loves God. Everything is wonderful. And then the fall comes. And when sin enters the world, the garden is no longer suitable as a temple. It's no longer suitable as a temple because the perfection of that holy relationship is broken. God cannot be where sin is. So what does he do? He scoots the sinners out of his 
temple. Now some time passes and God comes and goes talking with different people, but then he makes his covenant with Abraham and he says, you're going to be my people and I will be your God and I will live with you. And that's where we get the tent, the tabernacle, right? No matter where he sends Israel, they pack that tent up God goes with them as a pillar of smoke, a pillar of fire. They set the tent back up, and God rests in his house. God lives with his people. Time passes again, and the temple, the permanent temple, is built. Where's God? In the temple. God's people are identified as those with the temple. God lives there. God lives in this little room at the back, the Holy of Holies. And when they come to the temple, they are cognizant of the fact that God is there. And they make their way through the different areas of the temple, holier and holier and holier until they get to the one place where nobody can go except the high priest. And the high priest can only go there once a year. And there's no guarantee that he survives going in that holy of holies once once a year. They tie a rope around his legs so they can pull his body out, I guess. But that's it. That's God lives with his people. And then what happens to God's people? They crater. Well, they gradually crater. But God's people sin, and they sin, and they sin, and they they begin turning away from God. They begin making uh, God not as important, not as central to their identity, not as important as he was when they recognized the importance of the temple. And so God exiles them because he doesn't want to be in their presence. He wants them to once again return back to him and say, "Uh uh-uh, no, 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 with you alone, We have relationship with you alone, God, with you alone, Yahweh. That's who we have relationship. And of course, we saw how that story unfolds. But the temple, the temple is still central to the identity of God's people. God says, I'm going to make a new covenant. And in this new covenant, I will dwell in all those who are my people. So no more is it just a physical location, a spot on a map where you go to, now God would be with you forever, in you. Wherever you go, whatever you're doing, God goes with you. His temple goes with you. Paul says, you are temples of the Holy Spirit. And he's contrasting them with their immorality. He's saying, are you kidding me? Do you not remember that you are the temple, that God dwells in you? So no matter what you're doing with your body, no matter what you're doing with your life, no matter what thoughts are going through your head, no matter what words are coming out of your mouth, no matter what you're viewing with your eyes, you are the temple. You are the unchanging temple. And whatever you're doing, God is experiencing at the same time. You are not your own. God wants to be with you. God paid for you. God paid to make you holy. To What what did he say back here in in, 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 uh, uh, in 1 Corinthians? You were washed by the blood of Jesus. You were sanctified by the Holy Spirit of Jesus. You were justified in His name all by the Holy Spirit of God. 
That's how much God loves you. That's how much God wants to be with you. He's willing to pay the price so you can be washed clean. He's willing to pay the price so his spirit can come and dwell in you, so you can be his temple, so he can be with you all day long and enjoy your company and you his. What a great promise. What a great promise. And what should our reaction to be? Paul says, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, I know you've circled every therefore in the Bible. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Worship God with your bodies. It shouldn't be something that we decide about. It shouldn't be something that we, that we have to make a decision between this or that. It should be something that we naturally do. Why is it something we should naturally do? Because I was washed. I am being sanctified. <clears throat> I was justified. All these things are true of me, of you, of all of us, of all Christians. What natural outcome should that draw? We should honor God, worship God, live for God. Right? Oh, it gets better. It gets better. We're going to go in now in 1 Corinthians. We're going to go all the way back to chapter 3. I know it's a lot of pages, but go ahead and flip back there. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Watch this now. So why does God want to be with you? Because he loves you. Because he wants to be with you. But now watch this. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Don't you know, Paul's repeating himself, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. Now, it's tempting, I know. I said, Pastor, you just talked about this. We get it. But this says something completely different. If you brought your Greek Bible, you already know this. Okay? This is not speaking to the individual. In chapter 6, he's speaking to the individual. Here, Jimmy Tuckness would tell us, this is y'all, right? Y'all. Don't y'all know that you, y'all selves, y'all selves, I just, oh, that's pretty cool. Y'all selves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst. Now look at this. Look how this this unfolds here. Yeah, each of us individually are God's temple. You, me, everybody, God's temple. We got that. But it gets even better. Y'all, y'all selves. I like that word, y'all selves. Yeah. Y'all selves are God's temple together, collectively, together. You say, Pastor, what difference does this make? makes a huge difference because this helps you to understand the importance of Christ's church. Christ's church is not a club. Christ's church is not a social organization that we, that we uh, uh, join. Christ's church is God's dwelling place in the world. We are his show pony, if you will. I learned that from Ken, show pony. I don't know what it is, but it's something cool, right? So we are God's show pony. We are God's handiwork. Why? We are God's handiwork so that the people around us, the people up this street and down that street, that the people will look at us together and say something's going on with those people. The Holy Spirit is at work with those people. There is something different about those people, and I want to know what it is. I want to know how I can have the same quality of life that those people do. That's the emphasis there. Why does God want to be with us, y'alls? Why does God, be, why does God want to be with y'alls? 
because he wants to show his power. Now, he can show his power individually, and it's spectacular, but imagine if God shows his power throughout his entire church, throughout every single person in his church, his power is just glowing. It's just on fire. That's why God made you his temple. That's why God wants to be with you. That's why God dwells in you and sees you as his temple. You together are the temple. You individually are the temple. We collectively are his temple. God dwells in us at this moment. God is present Wherever we are at this moment, God is here in the Holy Spirit, ready to do everything that he's done throughout the Bible in you, individually, in us, collectively, in his church, all across the world. When you get that locked in, I know I, I know I say every week, spirit dwells in us. I know I, a thousand times I've said that. Take it one step further. You are the temple of God. And that adds this, this whole other dimension to what we've been talking about. God not only wants to be with you, he wants to be with all of us together. God wants to be with us on its individual basis. He wants to be with us collectively, with us as the church. He wants to work through us. He wants his Holy Spirit to continue to show his power in us, the weakest of weak, so that there would be no doubt that it's God's power that is at work in the world. When we get that temple locked into our heads, we we no longer would ever view the church as just an organization, just this social group, some some kind of a club. Now, it's, it's so much more important than that. It is the work of God. He washes us together clean. He sanctifies us together. He justifies us. He sends us out. He gives us our calling. He does all this together. That's his purpose. Why does he want to be with us? Because he loves us. Why does he want to be with us? Because he wants to show his power through us. He wants to be working in us. He wants to be working through us. He wants the world around us that really no longer has any kind of supernatural understanding. He wants to do something so incredible that there's no doubt that it is God at work in his people. So keep that whole story in mind. I know it's been a long story. I've been preaching for like two hours. But God's redemptive plan includes you includes me right he wants to involve the people that he loves he wants to use his church in the same way that he used his people Israel he wants to change us he wants to be amongst us he wants to live with us he wants to be the center of our lives so that his love that you're experiencing on your own becomes his love that the people around us experience as well. God wants to dwell in us, live in us, be in the center of us so that his love that you're experiencing on your own, that we experience collectively, so that the world around us sees that amazing love of God, sees the power of God working in us, sees the power of God changing us collectively. That's why God lives with us. That's why he wants to be with us. That's why he wants to dwell in us. Why does God want to be with you? Because he loves you. Why does God want to be with y'all? Because he wants to show his power. He wants to make it unmistakable that his power 
is at work. And here's something that's also true. God loves all of humankind. There's no one that's excluded from that. God loves all of humankind, and he wants to be with them as well. Those that are not yet his people, God loves them. God wants to be with those who are not yet his people. And if your experience of God's love, if your experience of the fullness of the Holy Spirit dwelling within you shows that love to another person, right? Maybe one of your relatives, maybe a friend, a neighbor, a coworker, uh, you know, maybe even an enemy. If your love that you're experiencing because God dwells in you shows that love to another person, man, you're playing your role in his redemptive plan. Could there be a greater thing than that for God to use you to show his love for another person to experience God's love through that? Could there be anything more worthy of you surrendering your life, of you giving up everything in this world because God dwells in you, because he's washed you clean, because he's sanctifying you, because he's justified you. Could there be anything more worthy of giving up everything so that you can serve God and show his love and show his power? Don't give your answer out loud. Let the Holy Spirit give the answer for you. Friends, the more we talk about the Holy Spirit, the the more intimate he becomes. The more intimate we see him as a person who wants and has relationship with us. And for us to be loved, for us to, to know this divine love, guys, there's nothing greater, nothing greater that you and I can know.